Good morning. Uh, two very brief announcements. The first is a sad one that Irma passed away last night. Um, we don't have details on her funeral yet. Uh, as soon as we do, we'll let everyone know. And secondly, uh, no Bible study this evening. And I'll send a text on that for those who aren't here. With that, I would ask that you turn to the call to worship on page three. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us worship God. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever and ever. 
Amen. Now we have music by Kurt. Let us pray. Holy God, as you open the eyes of our hearts, let us see you in new ways, that as you call us into new expressions of your love, we hear your message and live it and speak it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading, or first two readings, if you will, today are from the Old Testament book of Isaiah and Paul's book to the Roman church. Let us read now from Isaiah chapter 6, the first eight verses, and see if we can see what 
Isaiah saw. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And, he, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And now we turn to Paul's writings. He says, So then, sisters and brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as daughters and sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so we see two visions that draw a person close to God. One is Stunning, beyond description. The other is ordinary, that we are God's children. So let us take some time and contemplate the ways we might see God. Now, O oh Lord, we pray that you call us beyond ourselves, that we might begin to see you as you are and see ourselves as we are, that we might know you fully through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a second reading here from the Gospel of John, which will be read by Karen.
A reading from the New Testament book of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Here in the readings, thanks be to God. We cannot return. We cannot go backwards. We can't turn the time back one and a half years. We cannot return to the 70s or the 50s or the 1800s or the 1700s or the 1500s or the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or even the time of Christ. We cannot return to Eden. just like to share two events from yesterday that reflect on this idea a bit. Uh, One is a YouTube video. It's put out by a pastor who's not too far from here. He's PCA. Um, I profoundly disagree with about 80% of what he says. (laughs) Everybody should listen to somebody like that because it drives your thinking and it, 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 it really helps to deepen your thought. He's PCA, so he's very, very conservative compared to us, and I'm not even sure if he would worship with us. He's, he's that conservative. Um, however, he's answering a question from someone who is much more conservative than he is. And this person, he doesn't give his name, he says, this person says... I have found that I have come to believe theologically what your church believes with four exceptions. He says, uh, I'm looking for a church that sings only the Psalms. Okay. I'm also looking for a church that preaches from a Bible that is translated from what is called the Textus Receptus. This is the Bible the old King James Version that was translated from Greek text from 1500, 1513, I think it was, when Erasmus did that. I also want a church that does not celebrate the holidays. That means Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, Trinity Sunday. And I want the women to wear head coverings and don't throw anything at me. (laughs) Okay? And uh, Matt Everhard, the PCA pastor, says, well, that's not going to happen. He says, you may find a church that sings psalms only. And there's still a few around that preach from the King James, usually the New King James. You might find one that doesn't celebrate holidays. There are a few that still ask for head coverings. I don't know how effective that is. But you're not going to find all that. You're, you're, You're asking for something that's impossible in today's world. 
How that will come out, I don't know. But here's something I do know, that if this man who wants the Psalms only, Texas Receptus, no holidays and head coverings, had a child who was deathly ill, he would take him to a hospital. And he would not ask for a doctor that was schooled in ancient poetry or educated by Galen from 210. And he would not care if that doctor celebrated holidays. <laughs> And if it was a female, he would not ask her to wear a head covering. You see, he and, and, and many, many, many of us are, are divided in our lives. We want some of the old things, and yet in a pinch we go, we want that doctor to be educated at Harvard Medical School or better if we can find it, right? We, we can't go back. We, we can't seriously live in this old world. Okay. The, the second event is we went to Applebee's for supper. Of course, on the way in, we're discussing should we wear a mask in, wear, not wear a mask, you know. But when we saw that the young lady who was going to see this wasn't wearing a mask, all that went away. <laughs> okay. Supper was good. It's nice to go out and sit down and eat supper now. Hopefully a lot of you have done that and are comfortable doing that. But before the meal and after the meal, before the meal, uh, the menu, you scan the QR code. Okay. And I think that's pretty popular a lot of places now. And after the meal, you pay at the table. And again, that's been going on for some time. But I, I, I said to Karen on the way out, I said, for at least a few people, this has got to be terribly confusing. It's just not part of their lives. And so, on the surface, in, in very profound ways, life has changed a lot. And I also know that I'll get ads for Applebee's for months now. <laughs> okay? Gee, how do they know? Uh, but, but we can never return to the old normal. It's just not there. And I don't think that we should. And it, it's not because I'm a techie at heart. It, it's not because I actually do read books written by people from Harvard. It's that I think God is calling us to a new life. I think it, if we look at the events and the turmoil and the chaos of the past year and a half and stop and think about it, a lot of the old institutions are going to drop away and some of that is going to be very, very good. And yet, there's a new uncertainty and new challenges and new difficulties ahead of us that God is calling us into. And, and that's what I want to use this Isaiah passage to explore for a few moments that Isaiah lived in a time of turmoil, and yet he's called to a new life. And how this unfolds is instructive, I think, for us. And, and I hope it'll help us. Um, I, Isaiah lives during the time of four different kings. And if you know a little bit of history or, or watch, uh, probably too often quoted, Game of Thrones, you know that when kings transition, chaos ensues. And so when he writes that in the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, okay, all perdition is going to break loose. I love that I can say that and not swear. <laughs> uh, for Israel and for Isaiah, the future is unknown. It's completely unknown. They don't know if the new king will be able to transfer power peacefully or through war or through destruction. They don't know if Assyria is now going to attack. They don't know anything like that. Th their world is just completely unsettled. And so Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw. He uses the regular word for seeing, just like I see Debbie or 
I see Bob. He's, he's using a very common word for a very common experience. There's, there's nothing mystical going on here. Um, I saw, for Isaiah, this is a concrete experience, as concrete as us being here. And he struggles, as the prophets so often do, as anyone who's had an experience of God does, he struggles to put this into some kind of understandable words, something you can maybe see what he saw through his words. He says, I saw the Lord on a throne high and lifted up. The only expressions available to him He's never seen SpaceX take off. He can't use that. He's never seen Star Wars. He doesn't have CGI to expand his experience for you. He has to use the words and the experiences of his time. And he sees this magnificent picture of God on a throne with these angels, seraphim. We don't really know what they looked like, except they were huge, frightening And it makes Isaiah, Isaiah feel somewhat small and unworthy. And reminds me of Moses who, when he's walking through the desert and a bush burst into flame, he takes off his shoes, he's on holy ground. Or Peter with Christ and there's this great catch of fish and Peter falls on his face in the boat and says, depart from me for I'm a sinful human being. Or even the women at the tomb when they realize that Jesus is risen. They run in fear and trembling. Or maybe best the Magi who come to see the baby Jesus in his stable and the word is they fell flat on their face on the stable floor. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Kings. And so Isaiah sees on one hand that I'm starting to interpret this. I want to call it a, I keep wanting to call it a vision, and that says a whole lot about my mindset here 3,000 years later. But Isaiah sees on one hand that Israel and Assyria are not the major players in the world. That's not what's going on. But what really, I'm, I'm using Bart's words here, what really shatters and seizes Isaiah, what pierces to the very joint and marrow, is the total disparity and discrepancy between the being and rule of God and Isaiah himself. That there's this tremendous difference between himself and God. And this is what really shatters him and collapses him to say, woe is me, for I am a human of unclean lips. He knows that before God he is just a speck so to speak. Yeah, I, I mentioned that I keep wanting to call this a vision. This, I'm, I'm trying to put it into my context. And I, I think this is what so many people try to do today, that we are so, um, Charles Taylor uses a word I used last week, buffered from this idea of God and divinity. We're so, there's such a distance between us and God that we try to put it in our own language. Our conceptions of God and power are far more limited than Isaiah's. And we want to say a vision, a dream, a hallucination. We want to say it's brain chemistry is out of whack. Or if you come out of the 70s, what mushrooms was he eating? Uh, or if you're from Harvard, he pr clearly has a mental disorder and his brain chemistry is malfunctioning. But Isaiah saw this. But there's a deeper point here that the, the center of the experience here is that the seraphim are calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Holiness, biblically, once again, is different than what we think of as holiness. We think of a holy person as a good person. Holiness is 
that which separates God from us, that makes God different from us. God is a tremendous mystery. God is wholly other. God is inexpressible. And they say this three times to perfect number, that God is perfectly other than us. If God is not us yet, and here again is what shatters Isaiah so much, having seen this, God calls him to do his work here on this earth. God will give Isaiah a commission to speak God's word to a people who will struggle to receive it. So I'm going to turn this to two questions, really. Uh, first question, do any of us, and as always, I include myself in these questions, do any of us really want to see God as intimately as Isaiah did? Do we really want to see God in whatever image we might have of high and lifted up of a train that fills that would be the end of his robe that fills the temple, that there's fire and smoke and the foundations of the universe shake. Do we, re do we really want to see God like this? And inside the question, inside the question is, do we really want to receive God's call? Do we really, really want to have our lives so totally upended that we put our entire ego on back burner. I think that hidden behind our, what I am calling in, again, in Charles Taylor's words, a buffered self, the self that is buffered from this direct connection or vision of the divine it's the fact that we have been called. I think each of us here and each of us in every church that's serious about their faith, which is a huge number of people, the call has been given. And the best question to ask, or maybe just a better question, is to what am I called? In your conversion, this event that we call being born again or being saved or being regenerated or even growing up in the church and having committed our lives to it in some degree. In our conversion, this born again experience when we become children of God, to what is it that we are being called? What God-given energy surge within us that we need to express. I think that's, if not the real question, it's certainly a real question. That in the Christian life to which we've been called, what is it that God calls us to express? Let's pray. Holy God, in this perception of our gifts, let us learn to be faithful, to see both sides of your call, the vast difference between you and us, and the powerful, intimate connection that we are your children with gifts given to nurture and bless your world. We ask that you give us strength to express them through Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, I, I was wondering as uh, I was thinking about this young man, who I'm sure is very, very sincere, who wants only psalm singing, what would he think? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs>
Uh, we do have special music again, Soul on Fire. We have people to sing for us. With us. Yes, the words are in the bulletin. Thank you for the correction. A few more wouldn't hurt either. Okay, Soul on Fire. Shall we pray? God, in this time we bring you our praises, knowing that you listen. We bring you our words, knowing that they are your words. And we bring you ourselves, asking that you fill us with that vision which will lead us into new life in new ways, but your ways, grounded in you who are the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
We pray this morning for the family of Irma as they struggle with their grief and their loss. We pray for all who find themselves displaced or disowned or suffering or in grief. We pray for these members near and dear to our congregation, Elmer and Sylvia Foley, Lee and Linda Gardner, Joel George, Marnie Gormley, Sylvan Gormley, Eric Hartman, Wayne Houck, Beth and Randy and Donna Heasley, Betty Henry, Donald and Ruth Hill. And we pray, Lord, for that blessing that you give us that makes us new in Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Go ahead, Linda. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.